This is On the Market, a Bigger Pockets podcast presented by Fundrise. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to On the Market. I'm your host, Dave Meyer, and I am joined today by the full On the Market panel. We have Jamil, Kathy, Henry, and James joining us. How's everyone doing? Fantastic. Awesome. Well, great. Thank you all for being here. We're going to do, uh, we're going to repeat a show that we tried a couple of months ago that was really popular. And basically, we gave homework again to each of the co hosts here and asked them to bring us the story that is most interesting to them about today's housing market. And given everything that is going on in the economy, there was probably many to choose from, I imagine. Uh, but I think we have some really interesting stories that show different sides to the housing market and different angles that you should be thinking about for your own investing. So with that, let's just jump into this. Uh, James, let's start with you. What story did you bring for us this week? Oh, so this is a really interesting um, story that I found. And, you know, over the last like year, we've all we've heard all about Wall, or actually last three to four years, we've heard about Wall Street buying up all the single family housing and and what's that been doing for inventory and the amount of money they've been spending. And this article, you know, is titled Real Estate Experts See a Big Sell Off in Coming as Treasure Yields uh, Close In on Cap Rates. And what that means is it, what they're talking about is the Treasury yield has increased dramatically over the last 12 months and it's now up to a 3.7% return. Whereas with the demand of single family housing, the cap rates have fallen also dramatically since 2014 and they've gone from 5.4% down to 4.4%. And what they're saying is the com- the margins have been compressed, just like we're all seeing or we've seen the last 24 months. Like to get into a deal, you had to buy on a slimmer margin. But what this article is talking about is this could be the major pullback and that real estate was not bi- – or Wall Street was not built for real estate it, because they, they want to work money. They want to get that stable return. But now they have easier investments that they can put it in. And, and what it's saying is Wall Street is going to lose its appetite because it takes a lot more work, takes a lot more staff, whereas they can just go put their money in in the treasury yield and, and just make almost the same return. So this could be the end of the hedge funds deploying massive amounts of money. The other thing I thought was interesting was it talks about how as banks, a lot of these hedge funds are financed by banks, and, and these banks could do margin calls, forcing inventory into the market, which would, you know, with the amount of homes that these companies have bought, could really increase it. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how the, these homes will never be seen again. They've been swallowed up by these hedge funds, but that could be actually the change is the, the hedge funds have banks, they got to report to the banks. And at the end of the day, they have to do what they say. And that's where we could see some increased uh, inventory. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting concept of that the, the returns, real estate returns have gone down so much that the banks are going to go somewhere else. And we could be seeing some more inventory hit the market because they, they got to clean up their books. Yeah, just to, just to clarify that for everyone, basically what this article and James are saying is that in the past, the yield on U.S. Treasuries, which is considered by many the safest investment in the world, was extremely low and unattractive. And that forced investors, including hedge funds and private equity firms, to invest in things like real estate for for many of them for the first time and dumped money into the stock market, into the equities market that helped inflate prices there. But as the Fed raises interest rates and bond yields start to rise, the spread between what is the safest investment in the world and real estate is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And that means that maybe these funds don't want to take the risk of buying single family homes or investing in multifamily properties and instead say, you know what, I'm going to give it to the U.S. government. They've never defaulted on a loan. I would rather just get my 4%, even though that's less than inflation, because there's a lot less work, like James said. Uh, What do the rest of you guys think about this story? Well, right off the hop, I feel like we're missing a piece of the conversation or whoever wrote the article is not talking about what happens when rates actually do start to come down a little bit? And then also, are we just not taking into consideration any appreciation? Is it just a, a, a piece that doesn't exist? And again, over time, we know that things will stabilize, right? We understand that rates will eventually come down. There is not a big uh, hidden inventory of real estate that is going to 
uh, magically appear. They're, these builders haven't been just shadow building houses that are just going to end up in the market someday that's going to flood the market with, with inventory. That, that's not happening. And so my, my opinion is, is that I think that this is a, a great comparison, the, the treasury yield and cap rates being very similar to each other. But I think that they're missing variables to this conversation. And I think that in order to make their argument, they purposely left out those variables. That's just my thoughts. It's, an, it's a really interesting uh, concept, though, moving forward that will, as cap rates get lower and lower, especially in commercial real estate, is it just an easier bet to, you know, to go into treasury something? If, if treasury, right now, the yield is 3.4%. Cap, there's some cap rates that are below that. True. Um, but again, there are other reasons to be in real estate, like the loan pay down. And like you know, Jamil was saying, there's other reasons besides just that cap rate that people like to be in real estate. Yeah, because there's the depreciation, the tax benefit. Oh, yeah. But what this is really targeting is the single family housing space, not the large apartment. And, and mm-hmm. you know, what it's saying is, you know, that real estate's always been an alternative investment. It because the amount of hedge fund money that has been put in it is actually starting to level out to where it's actually tied to Wall Street and the stock market more. But this could be the big exit, which is great for investors, right? We can get back to buying things normally. And this is actually going to create a huge buying opportunity for people that want to stay in the game. Yeah, I think it's I think it's great news for that for that first time home buyer or that person that was struggling to find something that they that they truly wanted to buy uh, over the past six months to a year. Because um, in those popular markets where people are looking is is where you're going to potentially see some of these homes come back uh, on the market. And, you know, that's a positive thing for the first time home buyer. I don't think it's a, you know, I don't think it's a huge, <clears throat> I don't think it's a huge deal from, from an investor standpoint. There's still, there's still opportunities out there, whether that, whether this happens or not um, from, from the investor's point of view, and there's still not enough inventory um, around the country and in, in many cities. So even with that, it's probably still a drop in the bucket compared to what, what we would need to solve the, the inventory issues. Yeah, and just to remember, we we had uh, John Burns on the show recently, who was talking about how much institutional investors really even impact the larger housing market. And on a national level, it's not very big. But of course, if you live in one of those markets like Charlotte or Atlanta, where they've been buying up like crazy, this will have a much bigger impact. All right, James, great story. I'll give you an A. I guess I'm grading these. <laughs> oh, the pressure's on. Oh, boy. No, I need to, I need to uh, inspire you for next time. It was a B plus. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be giving out A's on my first grade. Wow. Um, all right. Well, let's let's keep on the idea of rates here. Uh, Kathy, it sounds like you, you have some uh, Federal Reserve rate uh, wonkiness to, to bring to us. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I always want to focus on the Federal Reserve because at the end of the day, they are the ones manipulating everything. And if we're not paying attention to what they're doing and ahead of it, that's where you can kind of get caught off guard. That's why I did that on the market YouTube video with me on the beach kind of comparing what the Fed is doing in creating money or taking it out of the system, you know, to the, to the tides. Uh, so this article is uh, Bloomberg. It's from Bloomberg. And the title of it is, The Fed is about to go full throttle, uh, throttle on QT, but fear not. So what's QT? It's quantitative tightening. It's a Fed action. Uh, quantitative easing is when they're uh, you know, mm, stimulating the market and tightening is the opposite. So that's what we we knew was happening all year. But the interesting thing about this article, it's a really technical article. I still think it's super important for people to try their best to understand what the heck the Fed is doing. So read it, even if it's boring and confusing. Um, I'll just read some of the the subtitles in it. A glut of cash. Institutions have more cash than they know what to do with, so they're parking their money at the Fed. And so that's that's all you really need to know right now is money is still sloshing around. Mm. Like my on the market YouTube video, it's the it's it's like still this tsunami of money circulating. And the way that affects real estate investors, if you use that analogy, it's like those beachfront homes they're going to be more at risk than the ones that are a little bit on higher ground, you know? And and yet some of those beachfront properties are built for going through different cycles. Um, and other ones aren't. Like literally where I live, every year, I, you know, we were out surfing and there was wood, like 
in the water because certain properties, patios and, uh, you know, decks went out into the ocean when the, the high tide got there. So certain properties are going to be affected. Certain areas are going to be affected when this much money is flooded into the market. Um, there's going to be damage. Uh, there's there's going to absolutely be damage as the Fed pulls that money back out. And that is what is happening. It's been happening all year. The Fed flooded the market. And when I say flooded, I was just looking up these stats. In March of 2020, there was $15.4 trillion circulating um, in the M2, the Fred M2. Look that up. Today, just two and a half years later, it's $21 trillion still. So still today, we're $6 trillion more money sloshing around. Even today, with all this tightening going, all this pulling money back out with raising rates, <laughs> we're not there. There's still too much money circulating. Um, and that's why we keep seeing job growth. That's why we keep seeing inflation. And this is the story that isn't told. You're not going to find this in this article. And that's confusing to me. It's like, wait, the Fed created the flood. Now they're pulling it back and they're like, oh, we don't know what happened. But, they, you know, they did it. Uh, to compare this again to our last show, when we talked about how does this compare to 2008, <laughs> this shocked me. I just looked this up today. In 2007, right in December, so right before 2008, when things really fell apart, uh, there was seven, are you ready, guys? This is crazy. $7.4 trillion in circulation at that time. Hmm. So at the peak of the market last time, there was $7.4 trillion in circulation. Today, there's three times that. $21 trillion sloshing around, not knowing where to go. So the Fed is doing this reverse repo where they're they're like having the banks put it back in as they're tapering. It's just all a manipulated game. It's all going to affect markets differently. And that's kind of why for my real estate strategy, I stay out of the headline cities. Like we're in the little areas that nobody talks about. The hedge funds aren't going in there. Um, we just kind of stay in the little... The real estate that's on higher ground, I guess you could say. <laughs> Arkansas not looking so bad now, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because last week, uh, we're recording this in the middle of September, uh, the Fed came out and, or excuse me, uh, inflation data came out and showed that it, you know, ticked back up a little bit, at least for core inflation. It seems, Kathy, that, you know, all this money sloshing around, that's an indication that what the Fed is doing in terms of raising rates so far, hasn't really had an impact on monetary supply yet, or ever. You know, it, it so far, there does seem to be too much money circulating. But the the mortgage rates, that's what's affecting the housing market, obviously. And, and again, for those in shock or upset about it, just remember last year at this time, the, the headline news was, oh my gosh, home prices are out of control. They're going up too fast and there's nothing to buy and there's 90 people at an open house. That wasn't good. So where we are today is a better place than that. Um, and some markets will see price declines because prices just went up. I mean, in some markets, we know this, 30 40%, not sustainable. Those markets are going to feel a pullback. But then again, Arkansas, you know, maybe not. Maybe not. We'll see. So it's all about, you know, taking cover in times when things are changing so rapidly and being in those stable markets where, you know, all, all this sloshing around isn't really happening, <laughs> where it's just the fundamentals. Uh, one thing that, you know, I, I've been hearing, you know, we're, we're a brokered shop and we work with a lot of different investors. And, the, and like Kathy said, some people not, might not like this. And the, the Fed definitely printed just way too much money. But we all had the, the we, we reaped a lot of benefit over the last 18 months as investors. We our rents are up, our profits were up. And, and as they correct this, they they went way overboard. They're going to probably have to go way overboard the other way to kind of fix this. And, you know, right now people are kind of locking up because they're so afraid of where that tidal wave could come back the other way. But at the end of the day, you can always just adapt as they're correcting. I mean, we pivoted the same way when they infuse that much money, we pivoted how we were buying to keep st to stay in the game. And, and for like, as the Fed corrects, it's just really important that you're reading these articles like that Kathy put together, because you can kind of read it and then just ad adapt your plan on the way out the door um, and, and just really pay attention to what they're doing. But with that inflation is ticking back up, I, I do think the Fed's going to keep hammering on this. The unemployment's not, it, uh, I mean, unemployment's still at an all time low. And so we might see the same 
the same way they reacted to COVID, we might see it to inflation and the unemployment and, and people just need to prepare. Mm-hmm. Find higher ground, like you said. Yeah. And, you know, James, when I say, you know, be careful of the sloshy markets, you know, obviously your market and Jamil's and, and Phoenix, these are these are markets that really saw a lot of population growth, a lot of people moving there and a lot of bidding up. Right. So that's still in play. The difference is now those people are getting better deals. Right. So in in some of these hot markets, if, if people are still just dying to go to Phoenix because it's still cheaper than California or the same with Seattle, they're still it's a better it's a better deal. Uh, yeah. For them. I, I actually just wrote an article for Bigger Pockets about this last week, how those markets are looking the most to to bubblicious to uh, use Jamil's terms. But they're also like they became really hot for a good reason. It's because there's a lot of economic and population growth in those cities. And so they do offer really good long term prospects for investing, but not, in my opinion, at current market rates. But like if you can buy below market rates, it still could be like a good long term investment as long as you're not buying and catching a falling knife, as they say. Right. But Jamil, that's actually a great transition because you're homework assignment came in and you wanted to talk about housing markets that are at risk. Is that right? Absolutely. So we had the opportunity to speak to Rick Sharga before from Adam Data, and he just released an article that I found fascinating because he was talking about the most vulnerable housing markets in our current situation. And for me and for anybody listening to this, I think this is super important to pay attention to because, look, as real estate investors, we have to continue. We have to create opportunity. We have to look for where the opportunity is. We have to be like Kathy and we have to follow our our instincts based off of not trendy things, not what looks attractive and what the headlines are talking about, but where the fundamentals are. Where are we finding opportunity? Where are we finding real return? And I think Rick gives us some significant insight into this. So what they're talking about is the most vulnerable housing markets right now in the United States 13 out of the 50 most vulnerable markets were in inland California. And these are the variables that he's looking at to determine that. So he's looking at affordability. He's looking at percentage of uh, unemployment. And he's also looking at the percentage of your total income that's being used on housing. So when you look at like a market like Stockton, California, right now, the unemployment is 7%. And it's, that's dramatically higher than the national average. Oh. Right. But they're also way higher. But they're also using... Um, over 33% of their total income to pay for housing over there. So you also couple that with not the greatest employment opportunities, you have a vulnerable market. And I think that when you see that kind of information, it gives you insight as to where you should be placing your funds if you are getting into real estate right now, especially for long-term buy and hold. What I also found interesting were the other two markets that he found extremely vulnerable, and that was in Illinois and New Jersey, New York. So there were significant vulnerabilities, again, just based off of affordability, unemployment percentage, and the percentage of income that is used on housing. Uh, Illinois actually being number two, uh, m- uh, many of the counties over there having significant uh, affordability issues as well as unemployment. And so I think it's very important to pay attention to that data when you're looking at where you're going to be purchasing. But I have to hand it to Henry because Henry has been beating the drum of Arkansas for quite some time and we should have all been bobbing our heads to the rhythm. Absolutely. Yeah. Because the least vulnerable markets right now that Rick Sharga has Believe, or is, is, uh, believes our great investment opportunities are in the South, in the Midwest, specifically Arkansas. So when you're looking at these opportunities, you gotta, you got to ask why. Well, again, affordability is very, very, very good over there. You can still get uh, an incredible home, an incredible single family opportunity for well below the median price point of the primary markets that we've been talking about, like uh, Southern California, uh, coastal Southern California and Phoenix, for instance, uh, as well as the Midwest. So there's some significant opportunity for you as a buy and hold investor to find great deals, great long term buys in the South and in the Midwest markets. So 
For me, as a, an investor who is looking to place capital, who is looking for uh, opportunities for cash flow and possible appreciation over the next four to, for, you know, five to 10 years, I am absolutely going to be taking Henry out uh, on a date and to see if I can get him to sell me some great deals in Arkansas. Oh, when Rick says it, everybody wants to listen now. But when uh, when Henry says it, <laughs> everybody's got their earmuffs on. All right. All right. <laughs> what a great opportunity, though, with these bubble markets. Right. It's like these are really expensive, high appreciating markets that have good stability and a lot of good economy behind it. And the good thing about it is they also overcorrect. And this is going to be a huge buying opportunity, just like March of COVID, That's true. Mm -hmm. where we're seeing because the thing about those those markets is that the demographics of those buyers a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of tech, a lot of wealth. They confuse themselves and they're looking for that ultimate timing. Oh, I, they always want to time the market, which is impossible. You, you can kind of read and try to prepare and, and trend right with it, but you can't time it. And so what it does is it locks everyone up. I mean, we bought three homes last week for pricing that I have not seen since 2016. Yeah. And, and, and the opportunities are there. And that's why, like, I actually started researching the bubble markets because those are the best. Like, go where no one else wants to go, and that's where you're going to create the most amount of wealth. All right. Anything else before we move on to Henry's story for the week wait what did i get i didn't you you graded james and you didn't tell me what my grade was i didn't get a grade either yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> jamel i'm gonna give you a b minus for no reason at all i, I honestly ah! just made that that up <laughs> fair fair i don't know i just want to inspire you to, to do even better next time even though that was okay. a very good story um kathy i don't know I'm going to give you a C plus because I'm just being a tough grader. <laughs> wow. These are based on absolutely nothing. Damn, man. <laughs> that was my GPA, so I'm, I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Henry, see if you can uh, if if you can win this completely, this game of completely arbitrary uh, grades that I'm giving people. <laughs> All right, so my article, I just wanted to bring it back to, to, to rents. I think we're hearing a lot about housing market conditions in terms of what it's like to buy, should you buy. Um, you know, we're talking a lot about interest rates and that and, and that such, but there's a lot of investors, there are a lot of people who already bought, right? And so we're in this world of landlording and rents. And so I pulled this article from CNN Business and it says U.S. rents are at a record high for the 17th month in a row. And, um, you know, I just, I, I, I thought it was interesting from the perspective of like, I wanted to hear your guys' opinion on where you think rents are going to go. Essentially, the gist of the article is saying that rents hit a new record high. So average rent, eighteen seventy nine a month. Um, uh, and that's 12% up from a year previously. And when it dives into some of the ancillary numbers, you're looking at when landlords are doing a new lease, they are increasing rents on average of about $300 a month. And when landlords are doing a renewal with a current tenant, rents are going up an average of $160 a month, right? That's pretty significant. The article does go on to say that rent prices are expected to cool. But when it says cool, it's really just talking about the percentage growth year over year might cool off, but not necessarily that your rents are going to come down. Um, and it's it, for me, it's hard to see the forest through the trees. Like, it's hard for me to understand when and if rents do come down. I mean, traditionally, rents don't come down. We know that rents go up following housing prices rising, right? So rents trail behind it. In what situations do rents tend to come down? And I'm looking at this situation. So some of the things that, and, and speaking from a landlord's perspective, right, some of the things that are causing rents to go up are supplies, right? Supply is harder to get and cost more, right, because of inflation. So if it costs, as a landlord, if somebody moves out and I have to renovate a place, right, even just small stuff, paint floors, making it fresh again, that's more expensive now than it was a year ago. Right. And if I have to pay for that, we as investors are looking for what's my return on my investment. Right. How do I recoup the money that I'm spending? Right. And so that that results in rent increases. You've also got labor's more expensive. 
So it cost me more in materials and in labor to, to update a place. It also is costing people more sometimes with property management. Property managers are raising their rates because they have to keep staff and it's hard. I mean, there's, there's job openings everywhere. It's hard to keep good people working. And so they're having to pay more, which means they're passing those costs on to landlords, right? So where, where do we see that break? So it's good news from the perspective of if you own properties, right? You should be able to get a solid return on your investment, but not great news for people who need to rent. And then as interest rates continue to rise, we are expected to see potentially another interest rate hike tomorrow, right? As interest rates continue to rise, home sales cool, which means less people are buying. They still have to live somewhere, so they have to rent. And so that also indicates that rent prices are going to increase. So I'm interested to hear what you guys think about rents in your areas or if you own property what you're seeing as far as rent increasing and do you, what do you expect well i've got a, a question because you know right now the writing on the wall says st- stability in terms of uh we're, we're, we're going to hang out where we are in pricing for rent it's i don't, I don't believe we're we're it's going to decrease anytime soon but how do we account for the fact that there are layoffs coming that people are in certain industries being let go of their, uh, from their, from their positions. And so talent is going to be on sale very soon. Uh, Secondly, I think that the supply chain problems that we've been seeing will end up finding resolution. You, You can't, the kink in the hose can't stay forever. We're all staring at the hose. We all know where the kink is and the kink will relax itself, right? So that will find a a way out. And then in these markets where we have the vulnerability that we were talking about, where pricing could absolutely decline and people like James are going to come in and buy houses at prices that they paid in 2016, that investor is going to be inclined to decrease rent to get that property filled up as quickly as possible so that their return is being generated faster than normal. So Will there be ultimately a result where rent may dip because of these factors starting to normalize? I think realistically, in some markets, it could come down a little bit, Uh, but it's it's really obviously like everything going to be market specific. But just like with everything, the only way that prices come down is if there's an increase in supply or reduction in demand, and there's not going to be... I think the increases in supply are going to slow down a lot. We're already seeing pretty significant decreases in construction, although multifamily construction is much more resilient than single family home construction. Um, And demand right now is still strong because like to your point, Jamil, there haven't really been mass layoffs yet, which is good, but you know, that that is possible over the coming a couple of years. So I, I just, I'm not seeing right now, any way where we're going to see a huge glut of supply. I mean, the only, I don't really see that happening over the next couple of months on a national level right. and demand could fall if there's a really bad recession. And then there's a contraction in households. Basically people move in with their friends or family and there's a contraction in the total number of households that would reduce demand. But it still seems right now that we're not really that close to that. Of course that could change, but To me, I don't really see broad rent drops on a national level, at least in the next six months or so. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I was going to say the same thing when you started talking. It's all about supply and demand. Uh, And there is new supply coming on. And and Phoenix is one of those areas that's under under careful watch. Um, There's 19,000 units coming online in Phoenix uh, in single family. So there is new supply coming. And I would keep an eye on that. And that's one of the great data points from John Burns Real Estate Consulting. I've been following him for 20 years. And he comes out with that data of uh, where the new supply is coming online and where uh, permits and and starts are above job creation. And that's, that's a metric we've got to pay attention to. You know, it's not just supply right now, but what's coming. Yeah. And yeah, so just be aware, 19,000 units. And, you know, Jamil, I think you mentioned last time that you know, that could get absorbed, right? I, I don't remember your stats, but there's a, a shortage. So I think it was a how, one house for every 320 people or some crazy, crazy stat like that. So it's mm-hmm. th- there's still a tremendous 
lack, a tremendous shortage of, in, of inventory. And yeah, it's uh, going to be very interesting to see what's coming around the corner. And there is one unknown factor, though, that we have not seen before, which is the short term rental supply. Mm -hmm. There's a substantial amount of inventory that was bought on that. And I do know as the recession starts, things are cooling down. Those are not renting up as much. Those people might have to get those to market to pay because at the end of the day, they got to get those things filled. And that could be an extra it, it could be an extra form of supply coming our way that we're not really expecting that aren't currently in our market right now because they got they got taken by a different side. So I, I do think we're going to see more supply on that side. James, any idea how many houses were absorbed in the last like five years and taken from uh, actual residences and turned into short term rentals? Dave, what do you got? I just know the total Airbnb supply is about one point three million units, which is about one percent of the total market. I think it matters to. So Where? It's, it's, I mean, but it's it's very localized, just like everything. It's localized. You know, like you look at a, a vacation rental area, it's going to be it's going to be a significant amount. Much higher. Yeah. Yeah. But then there's been some cities that have been turned into vacation rental areas that maybe shouldn't have been in the first place. And I think those are the markets that the STRs could affect the most. Not like, you know, like Tahoe is always going to be a vacation rental market. Because it's all year round, but the, it's it's those artif artificially inflated or created STR markets. Oh, I I totally think that those the the hot short term rental markets of the last couple of years are going to get hammered over the next couple of years. Like we saw second home demand just go crazy for a while, um, but in, during the pandemic, and that combined with the boom in short term rental investing created huge demand in those places, and it's falling off. And to your point, James, if demand for vacation rentals from like the guests' perspective starts to come down, revenue is going to fall, and that could create honestly, maybe forced selling. I don't see forced selling happening in a lot of markets, but that is one that potentially could. That's where I think the foreclosures are coming. It's going to be a wave of investment property. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm with you. All right. Well, I'll give you my story uh, and then you can all give me an F or whatever grade you want to give me because I've just been a d about it. What about Henry? What did he get? Uh, Henry, you're going to get a B. I don't really know why, but it was pretty good. All right, so my story is about new listings. I don't know if you guys have been following this, but it's something I, I'm really uh, watching, and our, our friend Logan Motoshami on Housing Wire has been highlighting a lot. Uh, new listings, just if you don't know, is basically the amount of new homes that reach the market, um, which is a really interesting thing that we've been watching. We've been talking about the, so quote unquote, the lock-in effect over the last couple of months and whether people were going to sell their houses um, into a declining market where interest rates are much higher. And it seems like the answer is a very hard no right now. We're seeing that new listings have declined 18% year over year. And they always kind of start to decline after the summer, but it's it's going down more dramatically and sooner than it normally would. Um, and this, to me, has pretty big implications for what happens in the housing market because we're seeing rising interest rates deplete affordability, which takes demand out of the market. But if people just aren't going to sell their homes, that takes supply out of the market at the same time. And so it offsets at least some of the declines in demand. Um, and it just, to me, is is uh, sort of fascinating to see this all play out because I don't know if we've ever been in a situation like this where we might be entering a recession and the Fed is raising rates. And so people just don't want to sell their house and it could lead to really, really low inventory. And again, it's all localized, but we're seeing in some markets inventory, which is sort of going up pretty rapidly, like stabilize and start to level off um, in a couple of markets because fewer and fewer people are selling their homes. So to me, uh, it's it's probably sort of like a backstop. You know, I do think we're going to see prices decline in a lot of markets, but this is sort of like a backstop on top of good lending practices that prevent it from being sort of like a crash scenario that I know some people forecast that we're about to see. I love that uh, story, Dave, and I've been monitoring it in Phoenix as well, specifically uh, just for our own fix and flip business model, right? Because we are uh, we're always looking at whether or not it makes sense for us to deploy more capital into more and more projects. And so uh, it's I, I believe that this provides us at least some reprieve with respect to what we could see 
in the next six months for the inventory that we're currently working on, uh, that when we come and bring that inventory to the market, will we be able to sell uh, at, at, at least um, a decent enough speed for it to continue to make sense? And so uh, I'm, I, as, as hard as it is to say this, uh, this is sort of a silver lining, as you mentioned, a backstop uh, from creating a crash scenario. So I, 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 this, is, this is somewhat good news for me. I think, too, I mean, yes, new listings are down. Um, in my local market, we've started to, to flatten out a little bit. It's not necessarily down. But I, I think, too, people are people, right? And they don't always just sell because it's the best financial decision. I think what we're seeing is interest rates just don't feel normalized yet. It's still mm. changing all the time. Like, it's supposed to go up again, right? And, and until it sits constant for a little bit, people aren't going to just feel like, okay, well, this is just what the new normal is. And then they start moving forward. Because there's so much change, I think people are just sitting tight and saying, well, I don't want to sell yet because I got to go buy something. And that rate keeps going up. And if I don't have to sell, then I'll just sit tight. And they're being more conscience, conscious because um, they're seeing the news and seeing the fluctuation. But I think if interest rates level out for any sustainable period of time, that um, it'll just be what they are and people will get accustomed to it. And then you'll start to see a little more moving in the housing yeah. market. Just for reference for Jamil, like I'm looking at the data right now. In July, there was 9,300 new listings in Phoenix. That dropped to 7,300 by August in one right. month. That's like one an month. enormous, an enormous fall off. That is the level it was at basically in April 2020, like the toilet paper month where no one was yep. leaving their house. And like that's <laughs> what we're back at to right now. So it's it's just crazy. Like if it falls again like that, I don't know if it will fall again, but like that that was pretty wild to see. So I'm just curious if we'll keep going. Yeah. And I think part of that, though, is too like the absorption rates down so much is people aren't seeing the sales go through. So they don't want to list their house. And we're in this transition period where they don't have to sell yet or they don't have the need or maybe they didn't get laid off. You know, they're trying to still figure it out. And then a lot of people just they already have FOMO. They go, I missed it. And and I think that's why we've seen a sudden drop in listings, because the inventory, whereas new listings are down, at least in our market, inventory is up 58 percent in the last month. It jumped to 58 percent. And that's just because there's less transactions going on and it's slowly backfilling in. But I also think it's because people are, are just confused. They're like, well, if I list today, I just lost X amount of dollars. And that's how they're thinking. And so, yes, they may lock in. But there is one factor on that that I, I keep watching is, you know, I read some report that 71% of people that bought their homes in the last 18 months are unhappy with their purchase. Yeah. Regret Really? It. Yep. Whoa. They didn't get to do inspections. No, no inspections. They didn't get a they didn't yeah, get a review true. the neighborhood. <laughs> and, and, and we saw it on our side. Yeah. We sold we sold 240 listings last year. And it was nuts. And people did not get to think about it. But one thing that is always something I'm watching is that, you know, American consumers, they, they have gotten used to just going, I don't like this anymore. I'm just gonna walk away. It, it, that is a mindset, and that's where I do think the lock-in effect could not be because if they just don't like it, they don't like it. If they're unha I mean, if you are living in a house that you're unhappy in, that causes lots of problems, all sorts. It causes problems that you can't even put data points on, right? It just makes the household unhappy, and those are things that you got to watch because now they can't sell because the values are devalued. They may have a good payment. They may have a good rate, but they're not happy where they live, and they, they're underwater, and that's what you, we, we're, we're really watching is what, where's the absorption rate? What are these new listings coming on? I think as the, the, the Fed gets done doing what they're doing, that will increase. All right. Anyone, anyone have any last thoughts on uh, any of the stories today before we move to our crowdsource section? Dave, I, I give you an A minus just so you... Wow, you're just sucking up to me, Jamel. I, I think I got it. I think I got an F because that wasn't even a news story. I just looked at it. No, no, I, I was sucking up. I, I, I was, I okay. was absolutely right, sucking good. up. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, now Jamil, Jamil has won today. He gets an A plus, yes! and the, the, the rest of you have failed. All right, we're gonna take a quick break, but we'll be right back with some questions from the Bigger Pockets forums.
All right, welcome back to On The Market. Today, we're gonna answer one question from the Bigger Pockets forums. And if you wanna ask questions to the panel, go to the Bigger Pockets forums. We have an On The Market forum specifically. Go ask questions there, and you can even ask questions to a specific host or panelist. This one, we're gonna first direct it at James, and then I wanna get everyone's opinion about this. It comes from Jennifer Sovia from Seattle. She says, hey there, I rent in Kirkland and I've been considering a house hack in the greater Seattle or Portland area. I see the market shifting and feel like I should wait until Q1. I was considering wholesaling and flipping in these markets too, but due to the cyclical, wow, I can't say that word, due to the cyclical nature, it makes me cautious. I know James Daner does well here, but I don't have his experience or capital. Jennifer, that makes two of us. Any advice on these markets? Thank you. James, what advice do you have for Jennifer? Um, so right now, y- y- you don't. If, if you're really looking to get into a property, don't be overcautious because what we have seen is in Kirkland is actually the biggest prime example of this. Is because the market has transitioned, we've seen a lot of transactions just fall through the table. Like builders locked up, uh, a lot of tech population are locking up, and we've seen a, So in Kirkland alone, we saw a 32 percent appreciation in March alone. We've seen that pull way back down 28%. So there's this big pullback to where you can actually get into a property to where we've already seen the most biggest drop in that. We've seen about a 30% drop off peak in Kirkland alone. With rates going up, if you want to wait till next quarter, your rate's going to be a point and a half higher, which is going to be another 15% on your affordability. And I don't project that the rates are going to, the, the pricing is going to, we've already seen that massive drop. And so if you wait, it's going to be, I think Kirkland especially is going to be a more of a trickle drop or any of these markets. And if you wait too long, you're just going to pay more anyways with your with your interest rate. And so those are, which you, as you're looking at these expensive markets or in the Pacific Northwest, Look at what they were doing and how big of a drop it was, and and those are the overcorrection drops. And if you've seen a more, uh, you know, more of a steady one, like in Capitol Hill, is another great neighborhood in, in in Washington that did not appreciate at the same rate that Kirkland did. It just had a little bit of a different vibe to it, so it was more of a steady growth during COVID. That's not really coming down as hard either. It's just kind of steadily kind of sitting there. And so if you're looking at these expensive markets, look at how much it dropped off peak, and that will kind of tell you when to buy or not to buy at the same time. Um, In addition to, in a lot of these older expensive markets, there are a lot of older sellers that actually, or sellers in general, that owe very little or nothing on there. And if you're looking to get into your first deal, they're actually going to, they may have felt like they missed the selling window at this point. If you're low on capital, you can talk to them about carrying the note, carrying some paper and getting that deal done. And people are a lot more open to it now. All right. Thanks, James. Appreciate that on on Jennifer's behalf. But I do want to ask the rest of you about sort of the the general gist of this question. Um, Henry, it seems like this this question is sort of asking, one, like, should I time the market? Um, And two, like, is house hacking cyclical in the way that Jennifer presumes wholesaling and flipping is, and don't worry, Jamel, I'll give you an opportunity <laughs> to respond to that. Um, I don't know if I call house hacking, house hacking cyclical. It's just the numbers. It's, it's all numbers. It's all numbers no matter which way you look at it, right? If you're worried about whether you should get in now or not, the, cons- the, the question really is, should I get in now at market rates? I think that's what she's asking. And my, my answer to that would be no, right? Um, I would, it, it, your, your biggest buffer to conditions changing um, is to be able to buy with some sort of a cushion. So if you can figure out ways to find those off-market deals from the people that need to sell, not want to sell, and it sounds like based on what James said, there's probably some opportunities out there on the MLS um, right now. And so if I were that person, I would go pull anything that's been listed longer than the average days on market for that area. And I would analyze them and start making offers at what you feel like you would like to get into that property for under market value offers where you feel like you can make money. You're going to, if you make 25 offers, you probably hear 24 no's, but maybe you get one person that wants to negotiate with you and then you land yourself a deal that you get under market value. And now you're in it with some cushion and then if, if, if prices do come down 10, 15, 20 percent, well, you've got some cushion. If your plan is to hold it for the long term, none of that's really going to matter. You'll still be able to make money through that. And so it's just about how how you get into a property. And if you're going to house hack, man, yeah, even 
better, even better, because now you can still take that same method of making making the, the 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 offer that makes sense to you, even if it's not what they're asking. And if you land something and then house hack it, and now you don't have to pay to live there, that sounds like a phenomenal strategy to me. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with house hacking, you have to like factor in the cost of renting against waiting as well. Kathy, I'm curious. I get this question all the time where people are like, why don't I just like wait to the market bottoms, quote unquote, and even if interest rates are higher and you're paying more, I'll just wait for rates to go down and then I'll refinance and then I'll have a house that I bought at a lower rate and then I will sometime in the future or or at a lower price, excuse me, and then at some time in the future, get a lower rate. What do you what do you think about that strategy? Everything depends on what you're trying to achieve. Are you buy and hold? Are you flipping? Are you living in it, house hacking? Like what what are you trying to do and start from there? Uh, if if six months ago, let's let's just give an example with Jamil's very um, open process of of the multifamily that he was going to pay almost double for, and today it's half the price. Um, so should the buyer today not buy that? Or like, obviously, the buyer today is getting a screaming deal, right? So there are opportunities out there. And I'm not I don't worry, I don't care what the interest rate is. I really don't. I care what the deal is and what the cash flow is, and the fundamentals of it. So again, I started investing when when it was 9%. So uh, the interest rate, and yes, eventually rates went down, and we got to refine the deal was even better, but it was good then. Uh, when we first purchased. And if it stayed at 9%, we would have been okay. So again, I don't care what the interest rate is. I personally think the interest rate is right where it needs to be and should be. Uh, Five, 6%. This is not a bad rate, right? What's bad is how high prices went because rates were so low for too long. If they stayed low, it would be a big mess, a bigger mess. Uh, So if you could find a deal that makes sense at a 6% rate, get it. You know, depending on what you're trying to achieve. If if you're trying to get cash flow and it cash flows at six percent, the fundamentals are there still. Your your tenant is paying down your loan for you um, over time, and and look it up. Look at pricing over time. It goes up. It goes up over time because, like I said, there's three times the money circulating now than 14 years ago. That's weird, and that is not something I I think is going to change course. I think the the Fed is addicted to creating money. Politicians like it. They like to spend money. Constituents like the politicians to spend money on them, as we've seen. So I don't think this is going to change. I think inflation is here to stay. Inflation is not new. Again, just go look at the last 40 years. It's been here. Uh, We just maybe don't see it as well. So, um, you know, again, make sure you know exactly what you're trying to achieve and stick with those fundamentals. Because we're seeing better cash flow now than we did six months ago. So when I sound positive to people who don't like it when I sound positive, got to understand what I'm looking for, which is, oh my gosh, I have more options and I have better cash flow. I don't care what the rate is. I really don't. And I'm buying in areas where there's massive job growth and diversification of jobs and they're jobs of the future. These are these are chip manufacturing areas Mm -hmm. where $53 billion just came in. Like these are jobs of the future where factories are coming in and being built. They're not going away. So anyway, it just know your goal and stick with it. Always, always timeless advice. Thank you, Kathy. (laughs) Jamil, you know, there's a uh, question in here that, or, or in the question, Jennifer basically says that wholesaling and flipping are cyclical. Two different strategies. So, but I know you, you you have experience with both. So, can you can you share with us sort of like are they cyclical? And if so, how do you sort of balance the cyclicality right now? Absolutely. And uh, Jennifer, great great opportunity to uh, clear something up for you. I I believe there's an inaccuracy in your concept of what wholesaling and uh, and how it works. Right? Yes, pricing is fluctuating and things are happening. But I absolutely crush it when the market is going up and when the market is going down. The fact is, is that in wholesale, what we are doing is we are looking for potential wherever it lies right now, right? So if pricing is going down, if we're, if we're making adjustments, we're making adjustments, but there's still buyers out there ready, willing, and able to take a deal. I just did a wholesale transaction where there was no other wholesaler was willing to pay what I was about to pay 
and I was able to still make a substantial assignment fee. I, I, I almost don't want to say it because it's, it's so high. Um, but it, it's, it, it, it was an incredible deal and it's happening in today's market, right? And so what I want to say to you, Jennifer, is I believe personally, a lot of times we will trick ourselves into finding a reason not to take action, not to get started, not to do the thing. Please don't let that happen to you. Please don't let the facts that interest rates are a little higher than they were last year stop you from taking action and learning a technique or a tool that will create massive opportunity for you in your life, financial freedom in your life for you, your family, and all of, uh, all of the people that you care about. Please don't let this be a reason why you do not take action. It sounds to me like this is just like analysis paralysis and not a real reason not to go. Yeah. So it sounds like everyone thinks, you know, basically house hacking um, is, is probably not cyclical, something that you could do um, in pretty much any market. I, I agree. Wholesaling, I've never done it, but Jamil, I'm taking your word for it and, and trust that you know what you're talking about. She did ask about flipping though, which I, I, I'm curious about. I know um, I'm not all of you flip, but uh, Jamil, James, Henry, you, you all do, right? Kathy, do you flip houses? Well, we flip to investors, right? So we're looking for the cash flow. Yes. Yeah, so yes. Yeah. So what do you guys think? Just quickly, we only have a few minutes left here. Quickly, would you be flipping as a newbie? I know you are all experienced, but as a newbie, would you be flipping houses in this market? I was flipping in 2008. Wow. I, I would I would pause on that for me personally. I would I would wait just a little while to see where things were before I would jump into fixing and flipping and I would stick to wholesale. It, you know, it depends on your appetite for risk. Uh, we were new in 2008 when the market crashed to flipping, but we didn't have a choice and we had to figure it out. And, and when, when the markets get hard, your job as an investor is to figure it out mm -hmm. and meet with the right people, build the right team around you. And, and the more, the harder it is, the more rewarding it's going to be. And, you know, get to work, build the right team around you. And I mean, yes, flipping is very risky. I bought three last week. It's not, and I bought them right. And, and as long as you're buying right and you can do your analysis right, at the same time, you can get into the market, and it's honestly the best time to learn. This is when you're going to learn how to do the hard work, and you're going to make more money this way. And, you know, it's, and I mean, to be honest, wholesaling and flipping are cyclical. If there is no demand from flippers, wholesaling becomes very hard as well. And so it's, it, it's all supply and demand. And, and right now, that what you're seeing is a lot of the flippers were newer investors that exited the market because they got a little nervous, but it allows the buy-in opportunities to, to, to resume on normal math, not fake math of what the Fed's controlling at that mm, point. Fake math. Love it. I think the latter part of what you said, James, is, is spot on, right? It's about it's about the deal. And so I would say my advice would be not to worry about your exit. You need to worry about your entry point. If you can enter the deal at the right price, if you want to flip it, you'll be able to. If you want to wholesale it, you'll be able to. If you want to wholesale it, you'll be able to. If you want to Airbnb it or, short or long term rent it, like you'll have the option and you'll have more options the better you buy that deal. And so if you focus your efforts, your time, your attention, your energy on becoming a master of your market and understanding what good deals are and then understanding how to go out there and get a hold of those good deals, you can, you, your exit strategy won't matter to you. You'll be able to do whatever you want. All right. Well, thank you all for answering Jennifer's question. It was a great question. We got a lot of good, uh, a lot of good debate and discussion about out of it. So thank you, Jennifer. And again, anyone who wants to ask these kind of questions, you can do that on the Bigger Pockets forums. Thank you, Henry, Jamil, James, Kathy, for joining us today for this episode. This was a lot of fun. You guys really all got A's. I was just trying to be a hard <laughs> for a little while, but you did it. a great job. And honestly, We've done the show format twice now and would love to hear from people in the YouTube comments or on Instagram what you think about this format because I think it's a lot of fun. I'm, I learn a lot every time we do this and, and would love to get everyone's feedback. Thank you all so much for listening and we'll see you again next time on The Market. On The Market is created by me, Dave Meyer, and Kaylin Bennett. Produced by Kaylin Bennett. Editing by Joel Esparza and Onyx Media. Copywriting by Nate Weintraub, and a very special thanks to the entire Bigger Pockets team. The content on the show on the market are opinions only. All listeners should independently verify data points, opinions, and investment strategies. <laughs>